The mobile network operator EE is the UK's largest mobile network in terms of customer numbers. They also boast the widest 4G footprint and a number of independent benchmarks claim and have evidence for them being the fastest 4G operator in the UK. However, remaining the fastest network while having so many data intensive customers is not an easy task and EE has consistently rolled out huge amounts of spectrum alongside other technologies in order to remain fast despite the large customer 4G load. So if we go back to 2016 and look at the kind of things that were deployed and upgraded then. So started the year with EE's ubiquitous band 3 layer, 20 megahertz of band 3, so 1800 megahertz of carrier ERFCN of 1667, which is their standard band 3 carrier. In high load areas, this was then complemented by band 7 spectrum, 20 megahertz of band 7, 2600 megahertz, which then combined with the band 3 um, 20 megahertz in CA, 40 megahertz of spectrum with 2x2 MIMO and 64 cram. You're looking at about 300 megabits per second as a maximum there, which is very tasty. But over a very busy site, that does obviously have speed implications, although very high speeds have been achieved on just two CA sites. Now, on very busy mast. This was then complemented with another band 7 carrier, this time 15 megahertz of band 7. So we now have three carriers, 16, 67, band 3, 3350 band 7 and 3179 band 7. So combined you're looking at a total speed of just over 400 megabits per second at 2x2 two two MIMO and 64 QAM downlink. Once again though, some sites just have an irresistible, well, un an incredible requirement for capacity, especially if you think sort of tech city in London. So what we've begun to see being deployed in areas of central city of London is an additional band 3 carrier alongside high order MIMO technologies like 4T4R, which we have not seen before. So just to start off with the additional band three carriers, like I say, EE's base layer is 20 megahertz on 1667. However, on these ultra busy sites, you see an additional band three carrier, which is 10 megahertz in bandwidth and uses the EIFCN of 1811. So, in other words, in order to have the sort of bandwidth set up, um, they will need to be organized, they don't overlap and things, and that's what the center frequency is. And just by describing it in the video, it and using it to name the carriers, it sort of avoids confusion over what bands are which, really. So that means that on a standard deployment site you're looking at 30 megahertz of band 3 and 35 megahertz of band 7 so 20 of band 3 10 of band 3 20 of band 7 and 15 of band 7 so that's a lot of spectrum that's 65 megahertz of spectrum and actually these sites in tech city with all that band 3 and band 7 also had band 20 5 megahertz of 800 megahertz 4G for the additional coverage that you gain from the low spectrum. So all in all you're looking at 70 megahertz of 4G spectrum. Now that is an awful lot of 4G spectrum. Of course it's FTD so it's paired so it's actually 70 megahertz by t times 2. So it's actually 140 megahertz of LTE bandwidth in total which is an absolutely colossal amount of spectrum. And that's not going into the 44R 4x4 MIMO yet. Purely with 2x2 MIMO and 64 QAM modulation, if you were able to aggregate all those bands together, 
you would be looking at an aggregate throughput of over 500 megabits per second. However, devices can't yet aggregate so many carries together, although of course that's over 500 megabits of capacity per sector of the site when considered using the 2x2 MIMO and 64 clam scheme. However, as you saw on the screenshot, showing the second band 3 carry. In fact, it was showing uh, aggregation between the normal band 3 carrier on 1667 and the second band 3 carrier on 1811, that the MIMO was showing up as 4x2 on the handset. And that indicates that the mast has four transmitting antennas. What that really means is that the mast is set up for 4x4 four four MIMO on band 3. And 4x4 four four MIMO is a pretty major thing to deploy on the network because not only does it massively improve the peak speeds available for devices up to about a factor of 2, but it actually also improves cell edge spectral performance thereby improving the average cell spectral efficiency in other words lifting overall capacity and enabling even higher speeds so 4x4 MIMO is definitely a very good thing to have now EE's not only been seen deploying it on their 30 MHz dual carrier band 3 but they've also been seen recently doing it on their band 7 20 MHz and 15 MHz carriers previously to say 2016, a number of urban EE mass carrying band 7 were using four feeders for band 7. However, this was just appearing on devices as bog standard 2x2 MIMO, and the way that worked was that the 2600 MHz band 7 was set up with four receive antennas on the mass side, and this is basically to improve our uplink performance and to make the band 7 coverage footprint more closely related to say the 3G 2100 footprint so the more antennas there was basically just to improve your like uplink performance rather than downlink performance as such so the 4x4 MIMO on band 7 is much like band 3 and that like I say it improves the downlink performance and it also improves cell spatial, uh, spectral efficiency as well so massive good news for that and what this all ties into, all this spectrum combined with the higher order MIMO, is that EE is doing gigabit speed 4G trials. In fact, well, not trials, but gigabit speed 4G actual deployments. And achieving near or at 1000 megabits per second using the spectrum that EE owns and things like 4x4 MIMO and 256 QAM is not all that challenging. And EE has achieved to near. 1000 megabits per second in the lab in a video which they have posted on their YouTube channel. And using one of these masks that we've seen in the wild, it is very possible to do that with modern Qualcomm Snapdragon X16 chips. In the video, they state that 4x4 MIMO on a Sony XZ Premium was used. Now we have to assume that it's also 256 QAM as well. And the only way to really achieve speeds like that with the spectrum holdings that can be carry aggregated and for 4x4 MIMO on that device are as follows. 20 megahertz of band 3 of carrier 1667 using 4x4 MIMO and 256 QAM. Then 20 megahertz of band 7 3350 using 4x4 MIMO and 256 QAM again and then 20 MHz of band 7 with 256 QAM but this time 4x2. Now in the live deployment market we've not seen EE use 20 MHz bandwidth on their second band 7 carrier. It's always been 15 MHz. However, in order to achieve the 979 megabits per second that were shown on the video, I think it's reasonable to assume that they used a 20 megahertz bandwidth carrier for the second band 7, because with a 15 megahertz bandwidth second band 7 carrier and therefore 55 
megahertz total bandwidth, you don't get quite the 979 megabits per second with the 4x4 MIMO and the 256 CRAM on the carriers as I've stated before, but it is very close. I just think in order to get that 979 megabits per second, you do really need to sort of have that extra 5, five megahertz of bandwidth ideally. And hopefully we will see in the live deployment that EE has the 20 megahertz second carrier appear over the 15 megahertz carrier that we have seen previously. 256 QAM and 4x4 MIMO have a colossal effect on the maximum obtainable throughput when in good signal conditions and with a suitable device. So with a 20 megahertz carrier with 2x2 MIMO and 64 QAM you're looking at about 150 megabits per second maximum downlink throughput. However, with 4x4 MIMO and 256 CRAM, you're looking at close to 400 megabits per second as a sort of maximum, which is a colossal jump. Although, to obtain a good benefit from 256 CRAM, you do need quite a well optimized network due to the sort of SINR required. 4x4, like we've said, has massive improvements aside from just downlink throughput, so like I say, cell spectral efficiency. So these technologies are all very useful and positive things to see in a network's deployment. I hope to get a device which is capable of this gigabit class LTE to try on some of EE's incredibly spectrum and technology rich sites in central London to sort of see what kind of speed I can get. However, the only thing with these sites is that the reason a lot of these technologies are deployed is because they are incredibly high load areas, which means that even with this phenomenal capacity available, the end user speeds may not be sort of a gigabit, for example, just because there's so many users sharing that capacity. So I hope you enjoyed looking at the gigabit future and even present for the UK and I'll see you on the next video.